the Human Security Officer, Part 40. Apparently word had gotten around about the Yosa's guest. As Penelope and Samir made their way back to the nebula they found a crowd had formed. Whispers cut from person to person as they jostled for a view. A young private happened to turn around to see Penelope. I doubt we're gonna see Moo, he stopped. His eyes first showed confusion at Penn's more civilian dress before quickly widening in recognition. S.C. S. Er, uh, he snapped to attention and saluted, an honor Scylla, uh, ma'am, captain. Please God just pick one. Ma'am is fine. At this point more soldiers turned and the cascade of attention rippled through the crowd. Jostling for a view of the ship switched to jostling for a view of the bay entrance. The energy teetered on that of a mob but never fell over the itch. Some threw questions, others simply stared but everyone came to a sudden halt when Samir's voice boomed over the bay intercom. Marines! Immediate silence. Samir brought his own voice down now that there was no competition. You will all clear a path for Penelope or I will have a lot of you praying to every god that you were back in basic. I already know that at least half of you have shit to be doing but I will overlook the momentary lapse in judgment. Now. Move. Before he'd even finished the sentence a wide corridor had been formed leading to the lowered bay door of the nebula. Not a soldier spoke but as Penelope began to walk the crowd did something. First one then two, five, ten and more until finally each attendant was saluting. Crisp and at attention each one held their stance, index finger against the edge of the eyebrow and palm out. It made her uncomfortable. To be honest she almost hated it but she knew they meant well by it. As she walked she tried not to linger tried to not make direct eye contact with anyone for too long. One face held her attention though. A young woman, couldn't have been active service for more than a couple of years, held her salute over a scarred face. Pock marks spattered randomly from her chin to her hairline near the left ear. Unlucky, or perhaps very lucky, with a grenade most likely. Penn didn't stop, didn't even slow, but she met the girl's gaze and held it as she passed. The girl had brown eyes pen noted as the moment passed and immediately wondered why the detail had stuck with her. Pen made it to the on-ramp and turned towards her friend. Samir had stopped short but held out his right hand. Pen took it and pulled him into a burly hug. About Cerberus, he started but she stopped him with a hand. No need. I was wrong to put it on you. Still, I know it meant a lot to you. Stay safe, all right? You to Sam. And I know it may be difficult, but stay in touch, yeah? Penn smiled and nodded. Samir stepped back and Penn backed up into the nebula's cargo bay. As she looked back over the gathered crowd, she saw the members of Fireteam Excalibur gathered in the doorway she'd come through. They joined in the salute. She thought back to her little deal with higher-ups. It was well fulfilled and she owed them nothing, but it tugged at her. Just as well, she knew everyone here meant well by the gesture. The pause was awkwardly long, but after only a few seconds she raised her own hand in a less than perfect salute before turning, the ramp rising behind her. Quickly the crowd dispersed, whispering here and there, as the blue nebula lifted off the bay floor and floated out into space. Penn wanted to collapse on her bed more than anything but forced herself to stop near Deeg and Gareth. They stood next to a small, reinforced container. Gareth seemed dubious of it, not that he could move it if he wanted to. Ah Penn it seems they loaded a little something onto the ship. SM said they brought it on just after unloading the other stuff. We're not being asked to run weapons, are we? Gareth asked. No. No one IA thinks they can just nonchalantly slip a hammer into my hands and think I'll start finding nails. Both non-humans took a few seconds to work through the turn of phrase. They were getting better. And are you going to put the tool to work? Dee gasped. No. NIA can solve its own problems. As for this, she opened the container to reveal a light version of the traditional shock drop armor and a hawk, I can take it to my room. 
tuck it away, suppose it is better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I suppose. Though my people have a saying about finding what you search for, Gareth offered. Penn didn't disagree and, was that a more respectful tone? Penn waved the thought away, more likely she just wasn't that good at interpreting the Waylon version of vocals. It was an odd series of clicks, nothing like human speech, but she thought she'd gotten the hang of it. I'll take it to my room but to be honest I'm exhausted right now so you mind if it stays here for a minute? She asked the captain. It's not in any danger of exploding imminently so no, not at all. Think I could go for a bit of rest as well. Gareth you can handle our first jump, no? Of course, it'll be the first time we're coming from Terran space, but I think I'll manage. Can get some work done on our inventory afterward as well. He looked around the cargo bay. Penn made a mental note to ask them what they were talking about, but right now it was time for some much-needed sleep. Not that she was much looking forward to what came with it. With a two-finger salute she excused herself, made her way to her room, and collapsed in a heap. Deeg followed suit soon after, leaving Gareth to chart the nebula's route to the formal. It was being held on a Corval Pillar planet this time. Not a capital per se, but a hub of politics and trade. Gareth noted the quickest route took them through two Terran systems before making it out of their territory. Tun E.T. took over the bridge while he made his way back to the cargo bay and did a complete review of the nebula's inventory. It was tedious but important and if he was being honest, he liked tedium. It was comfortable and gave him time to think. Right now, he needed a lot of that. His mind was still processing what he'd seen. It was almost too absurd to believe but he also couldn't deny it. He'd seen it with his own eyes. Out of all of it, and this surprised him, his mind kept returning to the final piece of the video. The image of Penn doubled over on the cold floor of a ship picked at him incessantly. He thought it would have been the part where she dismantled a killing machine with nothing but a hand axe, but he found that part not all that remarkable. Not that it wasn't impressive, it was but, maybe that's what it was. When he imagined Penn, he imagined her doing something like that. On the other hand, he found it difficult to imagine her in such a vulnerable position. She always seemed so cold and ready, but maybe that was more of a facade than he'd first thought. No one mentioned it, but a few crew members noticed Gareth's slower than normal pace. Penn's night was unpleasant to say the least. It wasn't one of the worst ones, when they'd say things, but it was vivid. Over and over again she watched the armored sentinel charge forward. Steel footfalls slow and that way dreams slow down but inevitable and unstoppable. Max body crunching and compressing as the machine forced him into the concrete wall. Max screaming and finally silence before an eruption of thermite. Then it'd start over. Finally Penn managed to force herself back to consciousness. It was a Herculean task, like swimming to the surface of a pool with weights attached to each arm and leg, but she managed it for hours of sleep, better than nothing she supposed and even though she was still tired she knew she wouldn't be able to roll over. She never could. So she set herself to bringing NIA's not so subtle gift to her room. It was something to do at the very least. As she entered the cargo bay, she saw Gareth sitting by the bay's main terminal. He looked back and forth between the terminal and a personal data pad. At this point he was the only other person in the cargo bay. She froze about halfway to the container. Something was wrong. The hair on the back of her neck stood on end and a chill ran down her spine. She'd learned to listen to that little voice in the back of her head, always speaking up when her subconscious noticed something that she didn't. Her eyes darted about. Her ears listened carefully. Hell, she even noted the temperature the taste and smell of the air through her breather. Nothing. No, the lights, it was the lights. She'd walked into the cargo bay through that specific door a hundred times now and she knew what lights should be flashing and where. You alright P- A crack, then a rush of pressure, and finally the hot roaring of an explosion ripped into the cargo bay.